Well, welcome everyone here in the room and welcome all of those that are joining us online. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your Aloha Friday to join us. <laughs> You're gonna see the theme a little bit later. I'm Tom Calvanese. I manage the Port Orford Field Station here in beautiful Port Orford, which you can see behind me in, through these windows. Uh, you're here today because you're interested in uh, gray whales and their foraging behavior. And you're gonna hear all about that from Team Heck Yeah. Uh, they have a lot to say. They've done amazing work here and they've been doing it for seven years, which I think is just incredible. So I just love this project and this team. You're going to hear all about them before you hear from them. And if you are, if you're tuning in, if you could mute yourself, that would help us because we're getting feedback at our end. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, but before you hear from Team Heck Yeah, you're going to hear from MSI intern Maddie English. And she's going to be talking about some work she did as part of her internship on purple sea urchins and the health of the urchins around here. And it really all ties in later. You're gonna hear more about the connection between the urchins and the kelp and the whales and this whole amazing ecosystem that we have to study here. Super happy to have everyone. Uh, we're here under the umbrella of the Marine Studies Initiative. And uh, that's the internship that Maddie just did this summer. Thanks everyone for coming. Those of you who are here in the room, everyone's nice and safely masked. So we're taking precautions. But we're really happy that you're joining us uh, from wherever you are. And I'm really excited to introduce Maddie English. So Maddie, please come. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, no mask? One your spot. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm Maddie. Um, as Tom said, I was here as the Marine Reserve Interpretation Intern for the Marine Studies Initiative this summer. And um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the reserve and about the urchin project that I did while I was here. So oh, Lisa. Why is this not so? <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> So a little bit of background information on the reserve. Um, it, the monitoring began in 2010 and it was established with restrictions in 2012. So we're reaching our 10 year mark of the reserve. And there will be a comprehensive review of this reserve, Redfish Rocks, uh, in 2023, as well as the rest of the marine reserves. So our marine reserve here is located a little bit south of Port Orford. 2.7 square miles in area and 131 feet deep at its deepest part. Um, includes rocky reef habitats, boulder fields, sandy bottoms, um, kelp forests, and intertidal. And it's home to a lot of different marine organisms. Um, so while I was here, I did a lot of different projects. I helped out with the monitoring of oceanographic conditions, specifically pH. So I installed a pH sensor. Um, I helped Pisco do intertidal ecology um, fieldwork and surveys. I did community outreach and education with the Redfish Rocks community team. And then my biggest project while I was here was the kelp restoration with the Oregon Kelp Alliance and the urchin research that I did that kind of came out of that. So because that was my main project, I'm going to focus on that one in my presentation. So for a little bit of background, um, the urchins that I studied are the purple urchins. I think it's Strongylocentridus purpuritus. Um, and they are the main urchin type here. We also have red urchins. And the purple urchins are very ab abundant, and their population sizes are actually increasing. Um, so their main food type is bull kelp, and the predators of the urchins are sea otters and sunflower sea stars, both of which we have, well, we have no sea otters and we have very few sunflower um, sea stars right now. So urchins don't have a predator, um, and so they're increasing. And as the urchin populations increase, the bull kelp decreases, and this is obviously a problem because if we don't have bull kelp forests, then we're going to lose a lot of habitat for different organisms, including um, the whales, which the whale team will talk about later. 
Um, so where I come into this, my main project was to study the reproductive state of the urchins on our coast. And I did that by measuring the gonads of the urchins. Um, so if you guys are sushi fans, um, you might've heard of uni or ro. Um, these are both terms for gonads, um, more polite, nice terms. Um, and so uni, we, we eat that, that you can get that in restaurants on sushi. And one way that we can tell whether or not an urchin is healthy or um, in a reproductive state is by analyzing that uni or the gonads. So what I was doing was measuring the gonadal index of the uni. And I'm gonna talk more about my methods now. So I sampled from four different sites. This is actually um, an ongoing research project. So I will have more sites in the future and I'm hoping to present at the State of the Coast Conference in the fall. So look for that if you want to kind of know the outcome of my research. But I sampled from four sites. I chose urchins from sites that had kelp present and sites that had no kelp. And um, I, we analyzed whether or not there was kelp by looking visually when I took the urchins, as well as their stomach contents. Um, so the first two sites that I sampled from did not have kelp and the second two did. And when I took the urchins, I measured them their full weight. And then I took the gonads out and divided the weight of the gonads, this is actually wrong now that I'm looking at it. It's the weight of the gonads divided by the weight of the full urchin and you get the gonadal index. Um, and so the larger the gonadal index, the more healthy the urchin is. Um, and so as you can see on this side, or I don't know if people on Zoom can see this, but this side is the uh, larger gonadal index. And um, according to kind of the commercial market for urchins, 10% or higher is um, good quality marketable uni. And so as you can see, we did not have a ton of that um, in our sites. And then anything about 4% or lower uh, is indicative of an urchin that came from an urchin baron. So you can see we had a lot more of those. And so another part of my project was not just collecting the weight of the gonads, but also analyzing the color. So we have, um, we have charts for color quality, but we don't have any for purple urchins on this coast. So part of my project was kind of creating a color chart to analyze the quality based on the color. And so this right here, for the people on Zoom, you can see where my arrow is. This is a picture of what the gonads should look like in a really, really healthy urchin. And then in the picture to the side, those dark brown thin lines, sorry, this is hard to show. Um, those are gonads in an urchin that would have come from an urchin baron. So it's very unhealthy, doesn't have a lot of food, um, very small gonads. And so I wanted to know if the color uh, had a relationship with the size. Um, and so I did a regression and I found that there is a positive relationship between the color of the gonads and the size of the gonads. Um, and so, and then this is the color chart that I created up top here. Um, based on all of my samples. So when I took samples, I analyzed the color of every single gonad from the samples and I put it into bins and I created this color chart so that we can more effectively analyze the urchins along our coast. And so this, these are graphs of the um, color frequency at my different sites. So these two sites are the sites that had no kelp um, or very little kelp. And so you can see that the colors of the gonads tended to be a lot darker and lower quality, um, or at least just in the middle quality because they didn't have a lot of food. Um, and so they weren't eating well, they weren't healthy, they didn't have healthy, bright gonads. And then these are the color charts um, for the two sites that did have kelp. So you can see a lot brighter, um, a lot brighter uni and more, more higher quality. So just looking into the future, the reason this is important, like I said, there's gonna be a review of the reserves in 2023. Um, and that review is gonna kind of evaluate the effectiveness of all of the Oregon reserves. And there's the potential for sizes to change and different rules and regulations to be created. Um, and so the idea is as the purple urchins continue to increase, their populations are also increasing within the reserve. And the reserve is a no-take zone. So we can't remove purple urchins from the reserve. 
And if they continue to rise and feed on the bulk health, we're going to lose our bulk health and we're going to lose a lot of biodiversity in the reserve as well, which is what the reserve was created to protect is the biodiversity. So the idea is that um, right now there's language in the management plan for um, Oregon reserves for to implement adaptive management. Um, and possibly in the future, because of this increasing purple urchin population, there could be the chance for us to implement that adaptive management and change the regulations and allow for scientists to go in and systematically remove some purple urchins so that we can continue to protect the biodiversity of the reserve. So that's kind of why I did this research. And these are my references. And then acknowledgments. So I'd like to acknowledge Tom Calvinese, my mentor um, and field station manager, the Oregon Kelp Alliance, who helped me get some of the samples, and Dave Lacey uh, and South Coast Tours, who took us on those trips to get some of the samples. Um, Tara Ramsey, Sarah Hamilton, um, Alice and Don and Lisa Hildebrand and the rest of Team Heck Yeah, who are gonna come up and speak to you guys about whales now. All right, thank you, Maddie. Um, I think if people have questions for Maddie, we will do them all as a big group at the end. So um, write them down or remember them. Um, in the meantime, we will switch gears here to our PowerPoint. Okay, I hope oops, I hope that is sharing. Um, if it isn't, I'm sure someone will shout out at me that it is not. Um, but yes, thank you again, everyone, for joining us in the room and online. Um, we're very excited to have you. Um, now begins the portion presented by Team Heck Yeah, um, which I will explain in a second why, why it is called that. Um, but this is a um, gray whale foraging ecology project that is in its seventh year now, um, started by Lee Torres and her um, then master student, Florence Sullivan, here in Fort Orford. Um, in conjunction with Tom Calvinese at the field station run by the Gen Lab. Um, and so we are the seventh team. Um, and so let's talk about Team Heck Yeah. So this is the team um, from this year that you're seeing on the screen. Um, we'll go left to right. Left is me. Um, my name is Lisa Hildebrand. I am a current PhD student in the Gen Lab as part of the Marine Mammal Institute. I've led this project. This project. <laughs> oh, oh, it's something <laughs> Okay. Um, just as a reminder to please mute yourself um, on Zoom because we're getting a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Um, so I'm Lisa Hildebrand. Um, I've been running this project for the last four years. Um, this is my last field season, and I am handing it off to Allison Dawn, who is on, um, uh, who's the second person uh, shown in this image. Um, Allison is an incoming master's student in the Gen Lab, and she's going to be taking over the helm and taking the project in a in a new direction um, or a slightly different direction. Um, and both of us will kind of talk about what we've done and what we're going to be doing later on in the presentation. Um, then we have our three incredible interns of this year. First up, we have Nadia Leal. Um, she is a OSU uh, undergraduate going into her senior year and she is majoring in marine mammal biology. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm getting nods. <laughs> um, Next up, we have Jason White, uh, who is also an OSU undergraduate um, going into his senior year, and he is majoring in fisheries and wildlife conservation sciences. Nods. And <laughs> last but not least, we have Damian Ammerman Smith, who is a Pacific High School student, high school students going into his senior year as well. So a bunch of seniors that we've got this year. Um, and Damien is actually the reason that the team is called Team Heck Yeah. Um, Damien is, is, has been quite a trendsetter of catchphrases throughout um, these past six weeks. Um, he, he's obviously the youngest team member, so he's a little, a little hipper, a little cooler. <laughs> he's got some really great phrases. And from the very beginning, um, Heck Yeah was something that Damien said a lot. And that kind of enthusiasm for any task caught on very quickly. And soon all of us were, were finding ourselves saying heck yeah a lot. Um, and so it, it became quite, uh, clear quite quickly that um, Team Heck Yeah should be the name of the team. And it also evolved into something that it wasn't just something we would say at positive moments, but also things we would say before a task that seemed daunting or difficult. But it gave us that kind of 
motivation and push to, you know, approach the daunting task with positivity. And I, I can say that it truly has become our mantra um, for this for this year. And um, I'm so excited to have Team Heck yeah come up here and tell you all about what we've been doing. Um, before I hand it off, um, there is a link um, here. Um, the Gem Lab has a blog um, website where we post every week. And the last four weeks have been taken over by Team Heck yeah. So I encourage you to go read those, um, see what all of our, um, what the whole team has had to say over the last couple weeks. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Nadia, who's going to, uh, Get things kick started. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about um, the species background. Um, we're going to talk about their migration. We're going to talk about history and then um, some identification techniques. And then we're also going to discuss our purpose and our goals for this project. So we are studying um, the gray whale, and their scientific name is Escritius robustus. And um, you should remember that because we're gonna discuss our gear a little later and then it's gonna be relevant then. Um, so the gray whale is baleen or mysticete. And that basically refers to um, their baleen um, plates and they are composed of keratin and that is a protein. And it essentially functions as a sieve when they go and feed in, um, along the sea floor. And keratin also makes up our um, nails and hair as well. Um, and then also, um, this is as opposed to odontocetes, and odontocetes are toothed whales, and um, that includes um, species such as the orca, and the orca is actually a, um, a predator of the gray whale. And um, we should also discuss um, the difference between um, the eastern North Pacific um, stock and the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. Um, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group is a subgroup, and um, they differ in regards to their extent of their migration, which we'll discuss in the next slide. And um, they also differ in the um, method that they use to feed. Um, so the Eastern North Pacific um, stock will almost exclusively um, feed bentically. And um, that refers to um, how they will go to the ocean floor. That's what benthic um, means, it means on um, the ocean floor. And um, they will scrape um, either on their left or their right Usually it's a right, um, but there's also lefties, just like humans with our hands. Um, and um, yeah, and then they'll um, basically, again, use their keratin um, plates, functions as a sieve, keeps the prey inside, and um, the uh, mud essentially gets um, um, sifted out. And on the next slide, we are going to discuss um, the migration of the Pacific Coast feeding group specifically, because that is the whales that we study here in Fort Orford. And um, so what they do essentially when they migrate, um, they will be in Baja California, Mexico um, during the winter time. And then um, they will start heading up north. And um, the purpose there is to feed. Um, so they'll make it up um, north and they will, um, specifically the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, um, will stop short of, um, of heading to the Arctic, which is where the Eastern North Pacific stock will head. Um, they'll go all the way to the Arctic, um, such as in seas such as the Bering Sea. Um, however, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group um, will um, feed along um, essentially the California coast and um, the Oregon coast. Um, so they'll stay there. And I actually have a figure at the top of the screen to the right. And um, that shows the um, coast of the Canadian border and also shows the coast of um, Oregon and California. And um, there's going to be different shadings, as you can see, along the coast. And the darker colors are going to indicate a greater quantity of gray whales. And um, as you can see, um, they do feed along the coast, and that is where their prey exists. And um, the prey of the gray whale includes mice and amphipods, and they are um, shrimp like species and uh, they are classified as crustaceans. And we can actually um, differentiate between um, species, species such as these um, using features um, on their bodies, um, as that is a, a part of the project as well. And um, like I said earlier, um, they have um, their birthing grounds that are in Baja California, uh, Mexico, that they um, stay in in the wintertime. And it serves as an excellent place to raise a calf um, to allow it to develop, um, stay from predators, and, and it essentially gives it 
um, shelter. Um, like I mentioned, um, their predator um, mainly is the orca. Um, so that warm area is a perfect, um, perfect place to raise their calves. And now we'll discuss a little bit about their history and tribulations. So um, they were historically hunted. And unfortunately, the Atlantic population um, was driven to extinction and it's believed to be um, due to um, whaling activities. Um, however, um, the International Whaling Commission and um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act has um, created some measures um, to alleviate that pressure and to reduce the impact of whaling on the population. And um, remarkably, the Eastern North Pacific stock has increased in their numbers. Um, so that is very, very good news. And um, though they are not historically hunted now, um, they still do face um, fishing gear entanglements. And they also have faced um, two unusual mortality events in the um, past, or in over two decades. And um, this, as it applies to gray whales, includes um, stranding with deceased whales. Um, and then they have also suffered um, from ship collisions. And um, along their migration, obviously, there's a lot of shipping traffic. Um, so they have been susceptible um, to those threats. And we actually have a, um, a regular here um, named Basil. And she has um, distinct um, markings from propellers. And um, we could actually use those scars to identify her. And that brings me to our identification slide. Um, so as you can see, I actually have a picture of Basil at the bottom left of your screen, and I can use the mouse right here to kind of <laughs> show you where that is. <laughs> and um, we can also use um, scars such as those um, uh, created by um, predators such as the orca. So in the picture that is to the right of Basil, you can see that this, um, this whale has suffered an attack from an orca. Um, so those scarrings we can use to re-identify um, whales um, in the future. And we can also use features such as the ridge knuckles. And at the top right of your screen, I have my mouse um, on the pictures. Um, um, you can see that there are um, two whales and we can tell that they're different um, based on the prominence of their ridge knuckles. Um, so um, comparing the top two photos on the, on the right um, top of your screen, um, you can see that it's more prominent on the right um, whale and it's less prominent on the left whale. And then beneath that, um, we can also use the dorsal hump as a feature to identify um, a whale. And um, in these two photos, you can see that the one on the right has a more prominent um, dorsal hump and then the one on the left um, has a more gradual dorsal hump. And then you can also use skin pigmentation to differentiate between whales. So at the bottom right of your screen, you can see that um, there is a whale that has some um, pretty evident white patches and it's patterns such as those that allow us to uh, recognize um, a particular whale. And then um, comparing it to the photo to the left of that whale, as you can see that it, do, it does not have those um, distinct markings. Um, so it's factors such as these um, that we can use to identify uh, whales in the area. And um, we use these, um, these techniques to um, identify whales such as Dual that we see here regularly or Moby Dick and um, Basil that we were talking about earlier. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the purposes and goals of the project here at Fort Orford. Um, so um, we are studying gray whale ecology and essentially that refers to us um, researching how um, gray whales interact with their environment. And um, so as Tom and Lisa mentioned, this is our seventh um, field season. So it's our seventh year. We've been developing lots of data over the years and we've been building on it and the data has been used um, very diff differently by um, a lot of our, our leaders. And um, in the first three years of this project, um, which was led by Florence Sullivan, um, previous master's student, um, she actually was able to um, develop some vessel guidelines um, uh, in response to um, the data that um, we have here in Fort Orford. And um, she found that um, 
measures such as staying at least 100 yards away from a gray well, um, if it's a full grown gray well, um, is best. And then if there's a cap uh, in a full grown gray well, uh, it's best to stay 150 yards. And then other things like um, not speeding up too fast until a gray well or leaving too fast. Um, so um, it's things such as those that have been um, very important for the gray well. And um, Lisa Hildebrand um, has led the project for the past four years, and this is her final year, and we are so lucky to have spent this season with her. And um, she has used the data to um, research prey quantity versus quality, and she will discuss that later in the presentation. And then um, Alice and Dawn will take us to the future. <laughs> and she will discuss the factors influencing prey aggregation later in the presentation also. And we can actually follow our whale friend and he will take us from the past <laughs> to the present. And that ends my art presentation. And so Jason will take it from here. Cool. All right, thank you, Nadia. So like she said, I'm gonna be uh, talking a little bit about the, the methods and the equipment that we use to conduct our work here in Fort Ordbury. So on any typical day, we start pretty early. We get up at around 6.15, trying to get all of our equipment out and on the water. Uh, we split up into two groups and our groups uh, spread out over our study area shown on this map here. Please pardon my poor motor coordination with this mouse. <laughs> this line that I'm trying to trace out is the uh, shoreline of the Port Orford area. Our cliff team is denoted by this little brown dot here next to Battle Rock. This is a port point on the cliff just behind us at the field station here. And then the kayak team will paddle out from the, the point just off the, the dock to Mill Rocks most mornings and try to collect six samples from Mill Rocks and then paddle all the way over to Titchener's Cove just to the west of the jetty area and collect six more samples before heading back in. So the responsibilities of the cliff team are to sight and track the whales as they travel through our study areas uh, to try to gain photo identification photos whenever possible, like Nadia talked about. And then there are also a very important aspect is uh, they are a safety watch for the kayak team when they're out on the water. The kayak team is responsible for gaining our zooplankton samples and for collecting the visual and oceanographic data that we can use to explain the zooplankton prey aggregations and how they're changing. So to sight the whales, the cliff team sets up a theodolite, which is this survey instrument shown right here. And that's, a, that's an instrument that's more commonly used in property surveying, but it allows us with a non-intrusive opportunity to study where the gray whales are in time and space. So that's why we like to use that. Uh, once we're all set up, we start to scan the horizon, looking for this telltale heart-shaped puppy blow of a gray whale in the near shore environment. Unfortunately, this year we haven't seen too many of those, but every time we do, it gets all of our hearts racing. So when we hear the word blow, the, the person operating the theodolite will attempt to aim the theodolite directly at where the whale's body meets the ocean. Uh, this is kind of poorly simulated with this picture taken through the scope of the theodolite looking at a rock. The crosshairs are just trying to get right there. And you can imagine that it's much more difficult with the whale moving through the water and hiding from us by diving every few minutes. Uh, once we get that crosshair set up where we need it, the person operating the theodolite will say fix, and a person operating the computer will record the um, angular measurements that the theodolite provides. So the theodolite will provide a horizontal angular measurement, which is used to uh, determine the direction that the whale is in relationship to that theodolite station. And then it also records a vertical angle, which we can then use to uh, calculate the horizontal distance from the theodolite using some trigonometry that thankfully the computer does for us based on our known height and that angle. And this is what the, the plots look like with all of those fixes from the theodolite. This whale started in the Mill Rocks area, as you can see there, and they tracked it quite a ways before it headed over to the Titchener's Cove area. And then this is very important because we can use this data along with all of our, our zooplankton prey samples to determine how the whales are behaving in these different areas while they feed. So like I said, the cliff team's other major responsibility is to be a safety watch for the kayak team. 
you can see from this picture, it's a small boat in a big ocean. So we want to make sure that we're keeping them safe. This is an active fishing port here in Port Orchard, which is wonderful, but it also means that there's a lot of vessel traffic that we have to contend with. There's also um, weather patterns that we need to be concerned with. There's fog, there's wind. So we want to make sure that we are warning the kayak team of anything that might be headed their way so that they, they're prepared for it. We also maintain um, radio contact and check in with the kayak team to make sure that they're not feeling too fatigued or it, to warn them, like I said before, if, if fog or anything else happens. So that brings me to the kayak team. We operate on the Good Ship Robustus. That's a two person kayak where the person in the front sits uh, with a GPS between their legs, navigating to each of our sample locations at all of our, our areas. The, that's very important because we need to be able to collect data from the exact same spots day to day, year to year, person to person, so that we're getting quality data to use in our analyses. Person in back, Damien here, is responsible for raising and lowering all of our probes, for collecting visual clarity data, and for getting result length and samples. And then this picture on the, the right, I just wanted to point out Dave Lacey here, who's um, one of our local business partners, operates South Coast Tours. He was kind enough to give us some very excellent kayak training. So I just wanted to give a quick thanks to Dave. This video is, is obviously sped up quite a bit, but this shows how we perform our samples. Right now, Damien is trying to maintain the kayak on location using the GPS. And I'm just unpacking all of our gear from the back of the kayak in that box. Once we get all the gear unpacked, we start with the, I think my video stopped playing. All right, looks like it's gonna start back over. But anyway, we, um, we unpack all of our gear and then we start with the Seki disc, which is this black and white thing shown here in this photo. The second disc will be dropped down into the water column until we can no longer see it. And then the rope attached to it has um, increments measured out every 0.5 meters. Once we can no longer see the second disc, we reel it back in and we count those increments until we come up with a distance that will help us determine the visual clarity. You can see me doing that over there on the right now. Uh, I think my video is just not gonna work for me today, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next thing we do once we get the visual clarity is we uh, set down our sensor array, which is just essentially a metal stick with a heavy weight on the bottom and a GoPro camera. And that's why the visual clarity is so important because the clarity of the water affects how much we can see on that camera. It also has a time depth recorder, which is used to um, measure the time, the depth, and the temperature throughout the water column as we raise and lower the probe. And a new addition this year is Allison's dissolved oxygen sensor, which helps us understand more of the oceanographic conditions. Um, the last thing we hook up is a prey net, a zooplankton net, which is shown right here. Uh, this is a, a funnel shaped net that we use to lower to the bottom of the ocean floor. And then we reel it in very quickly to try to attempt to try to keep the zooplankton from escaping and it's quite a work at it. It makes the whole kayak shift to the port side. <laughs> so no field season would be, would be complete without a little bit of um, equipment issues. And we were not immune to that this year either. So the, I wanted to highlight th our three biggest issues and how we came through those. The first one was with that new dissolved oxygen sensor. Um, you can see here in this photo, that we developed a small puncture in the plastic membrane where it actually takes its measurements. And you saw from Maddie's presentation earlier, urchins are very prevalent this year. And we think an urchin spine was actually the cause of this. So this required us to completely re redo the oxygen sensor membrane. We had to replace it. And then we had to order the parts to calibrate that membrane. Uh, and those, those took a few days to get in. But in the meantime, we decided we needed to prevent that from happening again. So you can see in that larger photo on the right, that was our, our basic plan for trying to protect the membrane. And what we came up with was some sink drain parts from the local hardware store, thanks Gold Beach Lumber, uh, coming through in a cinch. And we have since to have that issue happen again. The next issue is we lost our GoPro camera from our sensor array. You can see in that video, it took quite a hard fall as it reached the seafloor bottom, and it caused the mounting bracket to break from the GoPro. So 
when we reeled in the sensor array that left our GoPro behind. <laughs> Thankfully, um, our collaborators with the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology, Dr. Aaron Galloway and his team, we were able to recover this GoPro camera, surprisingly, within a couple of days. And in the meantime, we continued sampling using our spares. And then the last big issue I wanted to talk about is this cable fray that developed in our downrigger. And the downrigger is the winch that we use to raise and lower the center array and the zooplankton net. You can see here that it, uh, it kicked back down to two strands, which could have been catastrophic if we lost our, all of our equipment, we would have been done for the season. So we luckily found that problem on the first sampling station of the day. We pulled into port. Uh, we, we thought we were gonna be done until we could get some repair parts, but Lisa pulled through, again with Gold Beach Lumber, <laughs> and we were able to recover and get back on the water within an hour, finish out our sample regime. And then once we're done with all of the field work, the kayaking and the cliff team stuff, we head back to the lab where we download all of our data from the probes and processes. So Allison will have a nice neat data set to work with later on in the year. And then we go through each and every one of our zooplankton samples. Uh, these samples are kind of like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. <laughs> so uh, we look at every individual and some of the more interesting things we found were the polychaete larva shown in this middle photo here. But more typically we see things like amphipods, which are a low quality prey item and even better, mice and shrimp. Uh, this year, we managed to find a few jackpots. I think Nadia spent several hours counting our largest sample. And having almost 800 individual mice. Give it to Dana to talk about that. All righty. So this year has been quite fun and along with all the uh, research we have done to collect data, we have in fact seen some whales. Uh, these uh, first two uh, slides will be of whales that we saw during our training weeks, but for the main month of August through till today, um, we saw about nine whales in and around our study areas in uh, Mill Rocks and Kitchener's Cove. And um, unfortunately, that's quite low for this area. And we think that's probably got something to do with the fact that the, um, the zooplankton samples we've been taking, um, especially the mycid shrimp that the whales in the area li like to eat, they've been quite shrimpy this year, <laughs> uh, both in the size of the individual prey and the overall numbers of the samples. Um, and here are some of the more whale images. Um, there's, there's been a decent amount of, there's been some whales and <laughs> thankfully we have been able to get some good images of the ones we have seen. Now, um, gray whales are quite massive. They're, they can grow up to around 45 feet long, which if you need a reference, that's about 45 good sized Subway sandwiches <laughs> long. Um, and because they're so big, they need to be quite picky because they about where and when they feed because they need to make the in energy that they intake um, worth it to expend the energy to get the food. Uh, this video shows a very healthy swarm of mice uh, in and around um, a kelp forest. And uh, this shows part of why Port Orford has historically been a very good place to see whales. So you can see there's a swarm there as the GoPro came up. Um, but yes, as you can see, the, there's um, Port Orford has been a very good place to find mice and shrimp. There's been a lot of whales and um, because of that, and the whale, the mice just like they have typically liked the area because of all the environmental factors and the kelp forest. And um, uh, there are several factors affecting the health of um, zooplankton, one of which is upwelling, which is uh, the circulation of ocean currents um, that happens when the wind hits the water in a certain way. In the um, west coast of North America, this happens when winds coming from the north uh, push water as they go down. And because of the motion of the wind currents, combined with the rotation of the earth, 
the wind displaces the water and pushes it out perpendicular to the coast. Um, this displaced surface water uh, causes suction that pulls the water on the bottom of the ocean up, and with it, it brings colder water and nutrients that are very good for the mices. Now, um, there are also, un un unfortunately, uh, upwelling doesn't always happen consistently, and if there are instances where upwelling is weak or delayed, it can potentially have a negative effect on mycid populations. Now, um, as of yet, we do not have the most recent upwelling data, so we can't uh, yet analyze whether it has had a, could have had a sizable effect on this season. However, later in the year, um, Allison will be doing analyses on that to see if it has. Another very important factor potentially affecting zoo zooplankton health is the bulk health forest. Uh, these, when healthy, provide shelter to zooplankton and help them grow large and plentiful. As you can see in this video from five years ago, there, this area has a very large amount of, uh, of bulk health. There's a lot on the surface of the water and there's just overall a very populated area. So, and there's so much that the GoPro stick that we used to take the videos nearly got stuck on the way back up. Overall, that just shows how a healthy kelp patch is and what is good um, for the area. Now, um, th this area has unfortunately not stayed the same in the last five years. This video taken in that exact same spot um, this year uh, shows that there isn't nearly as much. If you can see behind Jason's arm, there is very little <laughs> if any that you can see on the surface of the water. And as the GoPro goes down, you can see that instead of a nice forest of kelp on the bottom of the water, it has instead been replaced with a spiky carpet of purple sea urchins. Uh, this is a very big dramatic change and it's happening all over the Port Orford coast. Uh, thankfully, we aren't ignoring this massive change that is happening just in our backyards. Um, groups like the Oregon Kelp Alliance, ORCA, um, are made up of scientists, resource managers, tribal members, um, tour guides, community researchers, or community members and researchers, and they're all working together to figure out what is fueling this change, um, what can be done and uh, what we should, what would be best to do. Um, and uh, one project that is working to um, learn more about kelp is Kelp to Wales, headed by Dr. Lee Torres of OSU and Dr. Aaron Galloway of the University of Oregon. And they are working together to monitor Oregon's kelp forests and investigate how kelp support whales. Uh, the, one aspect is the cam do in a stationary underwater camera um, that we put into the water uh, to hopefully catch whales as they, in a non invasive way, to uh, see them interacting with their environment. And this video uh, shows marine mammal Dr. Aaron Galloway <laughs> installing the cam do. And. Uh, <laughs> Um, and now, uh, Lisa will go into more detail on uh, the research that she has done and the um, things that she has been able to use the information the project has collected. All righty, thank you, team heck yeah. Um, so we are um, now at the point in the presentation where I, um, as Damien mentioned, will be talking about what I have done with the last few years of data that, um, you know, uh, that previous teams have collected. Um, and then I will pass it over to Allison, who will um, talk a little bit about what she plans to do um, in the future um, with um, the more years of data that we're collecting now. Um, so a big question um, that I wanted to answer with the data collected here in Port Orford by previous teams was, do gray whales count calories? Do they care about the quality of their food? You may be wondering, well, why would Lisa be even asking that question? Why, why would whales even think about calories or prey quality? 
And the reason is because we did some prey collections um, up in Newport um, of um, the different kinds of prey that we find in the areas where we see gray whales foraging a lot. And what we found is six predominant prey species, which you can see um, in the photos up here along the top. Um, and so we have two types of amphipods, two different kinds of mycid shrimp, and on the right we have two different kinds of crab larvae. And um, what I did with these um, different prey samples is that I tested them for their caloric content because I was interested to see do the prey have different um, prey qualities? You know, are some higher in calories, uh, are some lower, or is it all the same? And what I actually found was that there are significant differences in the caloric values of these different prey species. Um, uh, and as you can see just from this um, graph, there's two main species, um, one of the mycid shrimps, Neomyces rei and Dungeness crab um, megalope that have significantly higher calories than any of the other prey species that we see um, kind of along the Oregon coast. And so seeing this made me think um, and wonder whether gray whales are able to select prey based on their caloric values. And this is where the Port Orford um, research project and all the data that's been collected kind of comes in. So as Jason mentioned, um, we uh, do these prey assessments from the research kayak. And from this, we obtain our zooplankton samples, which I use to assess um, prey quality with. So by sifting through those prey samples, we know we count and identify each and every single specimen in there, and we know which species it is. And I use that to, um, I use that to do a community analysis, and then I could link it to that caloric prey um, from the graph that I showed you just one slide before. And then from our GoPro videos, we use those to assess how much prey is in an area as we're able to see the water column and see whether or not there are big swarms of zooplankton or if there's nothing at all. And then the final piece of the puzzle are um, the um, locations that we track with the theodolite, as Jason explained. And so I use those track lines from years past um, to um, plot out whale movements and behavior. And so you may be asking, how do I know from a track line what a whale is doing? How do I know if it's feeding or just searching or, or moving through an area? And we use something called residence um, in space and time. And this is a method which assigns behaviors, um, behavior states based on occupancy patterns in space and time within a given radius. So if you look at this um, image on the bottom, um, I hope you can all see my cursor, um, you can see that there's a radius drawn around each of these points. And so when a whale is transiting, so just moving through an area, trying to get from A to B, it spends very little time um, and very little and covers very little distance within that radius. It's just trying to get from one spot to the next and it doesn't stop within that radius. A searching whale, on the other hand, will, will cover a lot of distance and spend a lot of time within that radius because it's moving through an area and it's searching for a good prey patch to feed on. Once it finds what it's looking for and the whale switches into a foraging state, it's going to spend a lot of time within this radius, but it's not going to cover a lot of distance because it wants to make sure that it's getting all of those mouthfuls of yummy, delicious zooplankton prey that it just spent time searching for. So using this method, I was able to assign each different point in a track line to a behavioral state. And once I had my kind of whale behavior data figured out, I then wanted to um, figure out, you know, how much prey and what prey was in each of these areas. And to do this, um, we used the GoPro videos to assess the relative prey abundance. And um, what I did there was I took screenshots every five seconds from the pull up of each of our GoPro videos. Because as Jason mentioned, we do that at a slow, consistent speed. Um, once I had all of these screenshots for each um, GoPro drop, I was able to grid this into a three by three cell grid. And I assigned a value to each of those grid cells from zero to five based on how much zooplankton was in that box. Zero meaning there was absolutely none. Five was the highest amount of zooplankton possible for that box. So just as an example here, I've added um, the different scores to each of these cells. And once I did that, I got an average value for each screenshot. Once each screenshot was evaluated within a drop, I summed them all together to get the relative prey abundance. So how much prey was at one sampling station per day. And I did this for all GoPro videos for all stations that we had over the last three years. 
Then, as um, Jason mentioned, we do a lot of zooplankton sorting downstairs in the lab right here in Port Orchard. Um, and so thanks to the many uh, tireless hours of many interns um, from years past, um, uh, I had all of these sorted samples um, by species. And what we found through that work is that there was in fact three predominant prey species that accounted for over 95% of all of the tiny little individual critters that we um, identified. Um, and those three species are listed right here um, with their photos. And if you have a good memory, you might be able to remember these from one of my first slides, but it was one of the amphipods and two of the mycid shrimps that we found as being the predominant prey here in Oregon. And if there's one thing you remember from this slide, just remember that Neomyces rei is the mycid shrimp that has significantly higher calories than these other two prey species. Neomyce, uh, Holmesiomyces sculpta is kind of in the middle, and then Attilus tridens has the worst calories of all three of these. So as I had all that information, I was able to calculate proportions of each species per sampling station per day, and I could then use the caloric values of prey from the previous study to um, kind of tie all those things together and assess what is the prey quality on any given day. And so I was then able to um, kind of um, bring together the quality and the quantity data to make these um, prey maps um, in both Mill Rocks and Titchener's Cove for every day that we sampled for prey. And then on any given day where a whale came in and used our study areas, I was able to overlay the whale track line on top of those prey layers to try and see why whales were going to certain areas um, and why they were um, using certain areas more heavily versus kind of just traveling through other areas and trying to see whether those decisions were driven by prey quantity. So just do whales just want a lot of prey or whether they're selective and they look for the for high quality in their prey. So I did this um, for all of the um, whale track lines and um, prey data from the kayak that we had for the last three years. I overlaid all of those together and I'm going to present the results to you now um, to to come to a conclusion to that question of do gray whales count calories? So what you're seeing here, um, the, these plots are called violin plots and they show the distribution of the values um, of where whales foraged relative to the amount of prey in an area. Um, and these, uh, these um, violin plots are color coded by behavior state. So all the purple, plot, uh, all the purple shapes are when whales were foraging, all the kind of teal colored shapes are when whales were searching, and in yellow we have transiting or traveling whales. And so the first thing that we can see here is that whales foraged more um, in areas that had higher abundances of Neomyces rei, which remembers that high calorie mycid shrimp, than they searched um, and they transited in. This is not quite the same trend for whole messy mycid sculpta, the less caloric mycid shrimp, where whales searched more in areas dominated by the species than they foraged and transited in. And finally, for Attilus tridens, um, our low calorie amphipod species, species, whales didn't even forage in areas dominated by this prey species, even though they searched and transited through them. So even though they were encountering this prey species, they decided not to forage on it. And these kind of initial analyses were really interesting to us as it indicated that whales may have um, selectivity for certain prey species as they choose to forage on some and not on others. So I then did a further analysis to kind of um, assess the change in whale behavior relative to um, prey abundance when all um, prey species are grouped together and by individual prey species. Um, so what these plots show is number of whale points within a track line on the y-axis and the uh, mean relative abundance of prey, so how much prey on the x-axis. And once again, these dots and lines are color-coded by behavior. So purple is foraging, the teal is searching, and the yellow is transiting. And so when we have all prey grouped together, so irregardless of what prey species is dominating the, the prey field, when it's just all grouped together, we can see that when um, prey abundance increases, whales significantly increase their foraging behavior, which makes sense, right? There's more food, and so you would expect whales to spend more time and to forage in those areas in order to get the food. Their searching and their transiting behavior didn't really change much with increasing prey. 
But when we look at the split out by individual prey species, we get some really interesting differences. So for Neomyces rei, that super high calorie mysotrim species, with increasing abundance of Neomyces rei, whales also significantly increased their foraging behavior, but they also significantly decreased their searching and their transiting behavior, meaning that when they encounter this species, they will go for it and they'll feed on it, and they're really excited when it's there. This other mysa shrimp that has less calories, Holmesimysa sculpta, though, showed a different pattern where you can see that whales significantly increased their searching behavior when this um, prey species increased in abundance, but they didn't really change their foraging or their searching behavior, which indicates to us that um, gray whales um, aren't quite satisfied when they encounter a lot of this prey species. Rather, they, they're increasing their searching behavior. They're still kind of searching what they're looking for, but not really finding it when they encounter um, this, um, this prey species. And so it, it kind of became clear to us that it does seem like um, the PCFG um, gray whales that use this area and potentially the entire coast do display selection and avoidance of certain prey species based on their caloric value. Meaning that prey quality does have an important impact on how gray whales make foraging decisions um, when they come up here and as Nadia said, have to kind of regain all of their body weight before they migrate all the way down to Baja, California, Mexico. And so just from the work that I've done, the conclusions that we've been able to draw is that PCFG whales display that kind of selection and avoidance of certain species, because remember, they never foraged in areas where the amphipod until its tridents dominated the prey scape, but they always chose to forage in areas where the high calorie Neomyces rei, mysotrim, um, dominated the, the prey scape. And so prey quality is an important driver, at least at the micro scale um, that we um, um, study gray whales at here in making their foraging decisions. And it, it's something that shouldn't be overlooked in predator studies as the um, quality of prey is clearly an important um, determinant in um, whether or not a predator will feed. Because had we not known anything about the caloric content, we probably would have been really confused about why whales weren't foraging in areas of super high prey abundances um, and why they weren't choosing to kind of spend a lot of time there. So having that kind of fine scale knowledge about your prey is really important, which was kind of a big takeaway of, of the work that I did for my master's thesis is, yeah, you really have to understand your prey to better understand your predators. And on that note, I am going to hand it off to Allison Dawn to talk about where she will take the project in the future. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, thank you all for sticking around this long. I know it's a lot of information, but at this point, I would like to make our presentation interactive. So before I jump into what's next for the future of the Port Arthur project, I'd like to show you some footage from our underwater cameras. Um, and the audience that's tuning in, um, there's a, so let me just say there's a amorphous cloud sort of hanging out on the screen and there's also some pixelations, but ignore the pixelations and focus on the cloud. Go ahead and put in the chat box what you think this is and then the audience can just yell out if you have any guesses. <laughs> I guess the speed is a little bit faster, but, but did anyone have any initial guesses? Everyone thought mice is well. I you know, it was a turtle when I first saw it. Yeah, I thought a whale. <laughs> you know, I thought it was kelp too. I thought it was a floating piece of kelp until we got to the end of this video. And what do you know? We have a very dense cloud of mice. So as Damien talked about, these CAMDU underwater cameras were initially deployed in hopes that we could capture imagery of gray whales foraging in the water column. But it's great that even when we don't have the opportunity to see them, we can still monitor the prey as it's moving throughout the water column. Um, and as you all now know from Lisa's presentation, we have been able to establish that gray whales do have certain preference for prey quality. And so then the natural next question is, if we have large and dense clouds of high quality prey, um, what are the environmental drivers that are driving these aggregations? So that's exactly what I hope to pursue for my master's project. And I like to break down that big question into three smaller ones. So I like to ask the what, the where, and the which. So what environmental variables are driving where the prey go? So the prey patches, I'm interested in looking at both the horizontal 
and vertical extent in the water column. And then which prey comprise the patches? As you now know, we're able to assess composition and abundance already. And understanding this will allow us to further understand why whales choose to go to a certain area here in Port Orford versus another in our sampling site. So now I'll talk to you about the environmental drivers we'll be considering. I'm looking at two categories. I'm interested in both the physical characteristics that make up the port here, um, which includes the rock versus sandy bottom. I'm also interested in the oceanographic features that we've already been collecting over the seven year period. So temperature, turbidity, currents, and as you all know, we're now uh, collecting dissolved oxygen. So before I connect what dissolved oxygen has to do with whale foraging, I do want to address this photo in the background. It's not Port Orford. It's actually the Gulf of Mexico as it was experiencing a hypoxic event. So while the Oregon coast hasn't experienced something quite as dramatic, globally the ocean is undergoing deoxygenation. And that's due to climate change as well as anthropogenic nutrient inputs through eutrophication. Um, okay, so this figure has a lot going on. I would like to point you in the direction of just this red band. This is representing what's called an oxygen minimum zone. And um, globally, these oxygen minimum zones are expanding and reducing the amount of um, livable habitat for most marine animals. Um, and while these typically occur at depth because of climate change, like I said, they are expanding. This image was taken from the IUCN's 2019 issues brief where they stated that the oxygen um, in, the water, in the ocean has decreased by 2% since the middle of the 20th century. So you may be thinking 2% is very small, but a recent study also showed that zooplankton, including mice, respond to changes as small as 1%. So how do they respond? Well, they decrease their body size and a decrease in body size of mice means less whale food. And then not only that, but when mycids have a decrease in body size, they need less food to survive. And mycids graze on algae. So look at this green uh, little bloom over here. You can see if you follow the arrows that when algae um, decom de decomposes at the bottom, it uses up oxygen. So if less zooplankton are grazing on less algae, then that means there's more oxygen being used up, which only exacerbates the oxygen minimum zone issue. So that's a feedback loop that is definitely not ideal. So in conclusion for my master's, I'm interested in looking at what environmental variables, including but not limited to <laughs> dissolved oxygen, are contributing to prey aggregations. And that'll help us understand which variables we should be more closely monitoring in support of the PCFG population. So this has been a great um, summer of field work, and I'm very grateful to be a part of this legacy. And uh, before we conclude, I'll have Lisa come back up and, <laughs> and finish it off with our acknowledgements. Hey everyone, I promise we're almost done. Thank you everyone for sticking around in person and online. Um, before we move into some questions, um, uh, myself and Lee um, will be um, doing some, some acknowledgement. So as always, we have a, a great team of funders that support us every year and Lee will be addressing those a little more. Um, we have some individuals that I would like to thank, Barney Aridia for being very um, giving with your property, for letting us scan for whales for an entire month. Um, thank you very much. Um, Maddie English and Tara Ramsey, thank you for your uh, support in many different ways uh, during this field season in Port Orford. Um, usually I do, I do quite a short acknowledgement, but given that this is my final year, um, I'm feeling a little sentimental, so I hope you all bear with me as I thank some very important people um, to me um, who have been very important to me during this project. First of all, Tom Calvanese, the man behind this brilliant machine. Um, I don't know where I would have been without you. Probably uh, lost at sea searching for <laughs> GoPros. <laughs> um, you, you've always been a rock for me here at the field station, be it um, lost gear, be it intern drama, <laughs> be it me being too mean of a leader. You, you've always been here and I'm very, very grateful for you and that we've been able to work together for so long. Um, Dave Lacey, I don't know if you're online. I hope you are. You're the best. You with South Coast Tours, you've been so generous with your time and your gear. 
Um, yeah, we, we would be thrown up without you. Um, paddling with you is always so much fun. You've also been very giving with the Black Pearl. Um, you're awesome. Thank you um, so much. Erin Galloway, I don't know if you're online either, but you and your team of divers have come to the rescue so many times. Um, and now also this great collaboration um, with the Kelp to Whales project is super exciting. Um, and yes, you've definitely rescued um, us many a time. So thank you to Aaron and to his big, big group of divers. He definitely doesn't do it alone, but um, he is a big driving force of it. Um, Kevin Book and Taylor Eaton, um, you come down every year to train us all in first aid and make us feel much, much safer um, and very well supported here um, and have also helped us on numerous occasions with retrieving gear and diving for Cam Do. So thank you for your continued um, kind of collaboration and we're excited to keep working with you in the future. Um, and finally, Port Orford Sustainable Seafood, the guys and gals um, downstairs cutting fish right now. Um, thank you uh, for always providing us hungry scientists with fish and giving us opportunities to learn how to cut fish and process and see how a business is run. Um, especially Mike and Kian, thank you for being my friends here. And um, with that, I'm just going to hand it over to uh, Lee uh, before I start tearing up. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, wow, right? Wow, I mean, such an amazing presentation and group of people we had here this year. So um, yeah, I mean, I think you all got a taste for the amazing science that's happened here this year, as well as other years. You heard about dissolved oxygen, upwelling, bomb calorimetry, uh, photo ID migrations, you know, keratin, so lots of science. <laughs> That's awesome. And I heard, you know, I meet with the team regularly and I hear about stuff and they, they were telling me about all the cool new skills they learned from Excel to data management to uh, using a theodolite. And that's always great. And I know these skills will go on to help you all and your next steps. And that's that's very gratifying. But it also I also hear about things like team building and learning about their community and um, about fish and what's happening in their backyard. Um, and really, I hear each of them tell me, you know, about their transformative experience that helps them. Sorry, I'm getting choked. <laughs> that helps them with their next step. And that really is the motivating factor for the whole project itself. So you guys are really the dream, you know, that you're going to go on and be the next generation in awesome science. So, but to make it all happen, I need to thank our great funders. So first of all, the Marine Mammal Institute and the Gray Whale License Plate is a huge backer of the project this year. And so if you don't have a whale on your tail, you should get one because the money goes exactly to awesome projects like this that support great research and great outreach. Also, of course, the Wild Rivers Coast Alliance, they've been funding this project since the get-go and I'm very grateful for their continued support. The Port Orford Field Station and Plum Level and Square, the foundation that helps this great entity keep going in our project. And of course, South Coast Tours, as Lisa explained. So. I'm really grateful for all those um, support that makes this amazing project happen every year. Now, um, as you all heard, we are having a major transition in the project. So we are going to pass the torch. <laughs> I've heard a lot about this this year, our GoPro stick. And every year there's some drama, we lose something. And this year, of course, we haven't again, we lost the GoPro and the GoPro mount, but we got it back thanks to our awesome collaborators and team. So Lisa and Allison, please come up. Lisa, here is the torch. Lisa has been this amazing leader and it's been gratifying to watch her grow in that leadership role as a teacher and as a scientist. And that has been awesome for me and um, a huge, um, a huge just, it, yeah, just so gratifying. And it's been a pleasure to work with you. And she's staying with me. And so <laughs> so uh, I'm grateful. But now we're having Allison come on board. So please pass the GoPro stick. <laughs> <laughs> with all, all the problems surrounding it. <laughs> excited for Allison to take this project and upwards and onwards and so it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank 
you. Thank Good luck. You. <laughs> and then finally, you guys can stay up here. I have little thank you cards for our interns. So please come over. So I want to thank you to all of you guys. And with that, we're going to just open it up for questions. I'm going to sit down, but thank you all. And thank you all for coming. And yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop sharing the screen so we can pull up um, the chat and see people. Um, great work. Yay. Love this. Thank you all. Food. Um, okay, I do see a question. Yeah, so feel free to um, type your questions in the chat if you have any for the team. Um, I do see one. Um, from Charles, does domoic acid accumulate in any of the prey species and does it affect whales' prey selection and or caloric uptake? Charles, hello. <laughs> thank you for attending and thank you for the question. Um, it's an excellent one and uh, I have to admit that I do not know the answer to it. I actually don't know if domoic acid accumulation has been investigated in the um, prey species that we see here. I know a lot of work is done with uh, crab, Dungeness crab, um, but it's a good question and one that I unfortunately don't know the answer to, um, and so I also won't speculate on it. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, questions, in the, oh, we have, okay, hands up, yes, Nikki. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just wondering when you were talking about the migration of the whales and the protein and all those, um, how long do you monitor the radius? Is it just until they leave it or, don't, or just the time? Okay. That's a great question. Um, so, um, I, which I should have probably explained. The radius is something that that is done kind of ad, ad hoc after, and it's, it's created um, kind of in our computer programs and data scripts. Um, and it's something that's modeled. Um, we actually calculated based on the traveling speed of gray whales. There's two different ways that you can calculate which radius is best to use. Um, because you can use that method for many different, but basically any animal that you track, you can use this method for. And depending on kind of the size and the speed of, of the species you're studying, um, that radius will be different. And the way that we calculated it for this study is we, we use the um, traveling, the mean traveling speed of whales to kind of calculate that radius. Um, in order to kind of so this this kind of mod this mathematical model which I did not develop uh, Lee uh, Lee had a very big part in developing it um, it basically scales how many points fall within that radius and then kind of calculates what each point should be in relation to one another yeah great question <laughs> Tom uh, I have a question about the prey and Allison as well. Look at the prey. Lisa, in your work, you were showing us the difference in whale behavior in response to the caloric value of different species of prey. And I was picking up on the fact that they clearly preferred the fattier, juicier mice over the maybe the less juicier mice. <laughs> I know that's the scientific. <laughs> uh, my question is do you, uh, do they, are they, uh, do they appear in the same area? In other words, is the whale maybe uh, encountering the less uh, attractive or less nutritious one and then continuing to search because maybe the more nutritious one might be nearby? Um, for sure, I think, I think that that can happen. And actually we didn't look at the, this is, this is what's so great about like big long-term data sets. You can look at the data in so many different ways. We actually didn't look at it on kind of like a track by track basis in terms of like, oh, did this whale make that decision to leave this to go there? Um, but yeah, so, so I don't know. Um, it would be interesting, I think, to look at each track, like, I guess, yeah, each track line, um, like kind of point by point to see like, oh, the whale really decides to move on from here to go to that specific patch. Oh, we do have another uh, question. Uh, <laughs> why a kayak, not a slightly larger vessel? Not silly at all. Um, does, anyone, does anyone want to take that? Damien, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, Nadia, yeah. Maybe like when you 
maneuverability, like around the um, spots that we sample at, um, because they're very kind of, we get really close to rocks. So I think um, the kayak is a perfect um, vehicle um, to do so. Yes. Plus, it has a great workout. Too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Three excellent answers and combined as all the correct ones. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of kelp in our, or historically, there has been a lot of kelp in our in our study areas. As Nadia said, we go, we we basically almost sit right on top of rocks when we sample sometimes based on the tide. So having um, a, a, a boat that has a very um, short Oh. Shallow right. draft. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. I'm still learning. Um, that has a very shallow draft is really important to the work that we do. And it's also it's it's so quick, it's so easy to launch off of the beach with two people. Um, yeah, and as Jason said, good workout. Muscle motor. Muscle motor. <laughs> it looks like Dave was on. He left a comment for you, Lisa. Oh, really great presentation team. Heck yeah, I've got to see Lisa go what want to wish her good luck up north. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> um, feel free to add more questions online or anyone. Tom has another one. Right. No, it depends uh, on Tom. <laughs> so Danny and I want to ask you a question. Uh, what advice would, do you have for other students that might be interested in the experience that you just had? Uh, Contact Allison. <laughs> that would probably be my main advice. Um, be ready to do a lot of kayaking and wake up very early <laughs> than you thought you would. <laughs> it, it will change your entire sleeping schedule. But was Why it actually, worth it? It was most definitely. <laughs> However, there was a lot of instances where I had to repeatedly tell my family that I need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Should so we wrap? Oh, I yeah. Have a question to Damien also. <laughs> um, what, what have you considered this if it wasn't brought to your attention? Uh, if I didn't know about it, I, I, I'm not sure if I would have considered seeking out a um, learning more about the Port of Brickfield station. Um, it, it really, I, I'm glad that this was basically dropped into my lap by Elizabeth uh, last year's high school intern. But yeah, I really happened to stand to fate. <laughs> and we're happy that it happened. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, uh, experience like change your possible plan for the future? Uh, most definitely. It uh, has <laughs> definitely shifted my prospects for um, where I want to go in my life. I wanted to do engineering, but I, uh, now I've also wanted to pursue it in a more marine biology way. And I've also uh, decided, well, uh, I've also really wanted to go to OSU, which I did not. Um, Really considered OSU as a serious uh, option before I started this internship. Yeah, go be. <laughs> 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 like I think it definitely has. It kind of solidifies my passion for other uh, marine sciences, and um, so I'm very firm on what I want to do with my life. Um, and yeah, I, mean, I feel like the skills that we've um, developed here are really going to help help do that solve the problem. Yeah, I agree. It's just this was a great opportunity. It's so interesting to see science in action, and this just really reinforces my plans. That might be a really nice question to end on. I think. Um, thank you so much, everyone online, for for sticking around. Uh, we're gonna say goodbye. Can heck yeah, can wave. <laughs>